I'm introducing you guys. Okay. All right, so welcome everyone. I'm Professor Rebecca Mendez, and I want to thank you for coming to our Design Media Arts Lecture Series. And before I introduce our speakers tonight, I'd like to invite all of you to join um, the, our first Design Media Arts Alumni event that happens right here, right after the lecture in the um, EDA gallery space. So you're all welcome to join us and a warm welcome to all of the alumni here. I am very honored to present to you Chris Bird and Matt Clark from Visual Artist, United Visual Artists. Chris is a technical director and Matt is a creative director. UVA is a London-based collective of designers and artists Using software, LED projection, LED projection and lighting technologies, they create real-time immersive environments and responsive experiences for clients and collaborators in the music, theater, and fashion industries. They also create media art installations for museums as well as music videos. They have created the um, sets for uh, concerts of the most amazing bands, well, the ones that I love, uh, Chemical Brothers, Massive Attack, um, uncle. You too, I just don't like you too that much, but <laughs> I also have done that one. Um, in the seven years since they have founded, uh, they were founded, they have built a formidable international reputation with their interactive environments, media art installations, and captivating environmental visual graphics. The skills that they apply are the skills that we teach here research, programming, animation, design, video, photography, installation, and interaction. They do what some of you, if not all of you, would like to be doing in three to five years, and I'm sure some of you even have the ambition to try to accomplish it by the end of this spring when you graduate. And anyway, without further ado, I introduce Matt and Chris. Thank you, Rebecca. Okay, thanks uh, everyone for coming this evening. Um, uh, further to that uh, introduction, um, we'll just plow straight on in and tell you what we're going to talk about uh, tonight. Um, indeed, um, uh, all of this work we're gonna show you is uh, things that we've accomplished over the last five years. And hopefully it gives you a bit of an insight into our process at UVA um, and uh, give you some hints and tips of the things that we've learned along the way. So, yeah, um, as you know, my name is Matt Clark. Um, I'm the uh, founding partner and creative director of UVA. Um, yeah, one of the founders. I studied fine art sculpture and graphic design at uh, Campbell College of Arts in London. Um, I graduated in, God, 1997. Um, and after that, I spent five years as a freelancer, designer, um, and art director. Um, my name's Chris Bird, and I'm the production director of UVA and also one of the founding partners. Um, I went to Leeds University in 1989 and studied, strangely enough, applied biological sciences. Um, I was actually a VJ in the early 90s, um, <clears throat> back when it was not really well known. Um, people weren't writing books on it. It wasn't known as an art form in itself. And um, throughout the 90s, I've probably VJed at more... Um, parties and raves and events that any, any of you collectively may have even been to. Um, in 95, I was lucky enough to um, work with a band, The Prodigy, went on tour with them and kind of got the bug and really liked the whole production thing, the behind the scenes uh, uh, side of it and, uh, you know, got, got really kind of got addicted to this whole live performance thing. Um, how UVA started was um, Matt and I um, met in around 99 and uh, we worked on a few productions together and uh, we, we thought that uh, you know, we had a really good energy together and wanted to start a company. So really it's just a question of waiting for the right opportunity and uh, that opportunity came along with uh, a band Massive Attack. Um, they were releasing a new album called The uh, 100th Window, um, and uh, they went off on tour in 2003. Uh, in 2002, Matt and I got together and presented our work to them and uh, effectively won the commission to produce the uh, stage set and lighting design uh, and video content. 
Uh, here you can see an image of the show uh, where we were involved in designing the whole stage set. Uh, the video screen is an LED screen. Um, Back then it was uh, pretty rare, yeah. <laughs> medium Yeah, this, this, this screen was really quite, quite unique at its time. Um, in fact, one of the biggest manufacturers of LED screens, uh, Barco, uh, based in Europe, uh, they didn't even form their LED division until 99, so this is only sort of two, uh, two three years after, after they formed that division. Um, <clears throat> but great opportunity for us to get straight in there, and uh, I, I remember we were actually invited to pick the lighting designer. So we had a range of lighting designs we had to uh, choose from that presented to us, and, and we picked a guy called Vince Foster, who, who uh, we collaborated with on the whole lighting design. But really, the stage set and, and the LED screen was something that we really masterminded. Um, and, and it was really driven because the bands wanted to, uh, you know, they gave us a direction, and it was a simple direction, which was that everything can be represented in, in digital information. Um, so, uh, and they wanted real information. So we're using this LED screen, which traditionally has been used as a video display, as a graphical display board, so we could display information so, uh, that changed every day. Um, the, the inspiration, of course, is taken from these kind of boards that you see all around you all the time in train stations, uh, airports, and, um, and uh, we wanted to recreate this kind of effect to deliver data um, and uh, so the, uh, the show actually starts, this is a little, little um, shot from the top left corner of the screen, and uh, you can see the date here. This was the real date, the real longitude, latitude, the, the address of the place here, the, the show, the tour started there in Sydney, and then went around the world. Um, it had a little clock on the other side of the screen. Also, yeah, it? yeah, there was a great little start-off thing. We, we'd start, we'd, the screen would be black at the beginning of the show, and then exactly 10 minutes before they were supposed to come on stage, we put a real-time clock. It just came up in red in the middle, and it, all the lights would, were really dark. And I think the biggest gig we played on this tour had 80,000 people there. And uh, you just see the, the atmosphere, just, and they know that the band's coming on at exactly 10 o'clock or something, and really brought, brought some energy to it. Um, but it was supposed to start up like a DOS computer screen, yeah. and, um, and, and there then was, there was there a narrative. Was, yeah, there was a narrative to, to, the, to the show. And really this information was presented um, from very small to very large, so micro to macro. Um, so binary, on off, ones and zeros, hexadecimal code, uh, to the building blocks of reality, uh, this is a periodic table. Um, genetic information, uh, uh, up an order of magnitude to uh, biological systems. This image actually shows uh, an animation of a flower opening using its own um, genetic code. Um, and then to the humane uh, domain, uh, this image shows kind of emoticons and computer viruses that were picked up by our computers uh, on the tour. <laughs> yeah, we, we didn't get rid of them. Um, and also, you know, current affairs, news headlines. With the, the idea was that it was all being presented in the here and now. So you've got a sense that the, this show was happening right here, right now, and it was real information. This actually shows news headlines in, in French. Um, we this actually, was in Paris, was it? Yeah, you? I think it was in Paris, yeah. But we actually uh, uh, translated this into 36 different languages. Uh, inclu including Japanese. Yeah, including Japanese and an Russian. One. And, and actually, Chris was on the road, and I was back at the studio in London, designing these crazy fonts. You know, Japanese has over a thousand characters just for the most basic form. Um, and then emailing to, uh, them yeah. to him. Because how it worked, there was an animation um, that just uh, was the same every day, but you just changed the text files. So it appeared to be brand new. Um, but uh, the sequencing was always uh, absolutely locked to the beat. Um, and, and further to that, all these all these fonts that had been created, uh, Matt had very carefully thought about how the fonts would work on this particular screen. So the medium was very important that we chose the right medium, and then work backwards from there, and then produce the content and put it onto the medium to, cre to create an effect. So this is uh, local travel information. Um, and at the time, uh, we were in Japan, I think, and the, and the Iraq war just kicked off, and it kind of freaked us all out a bit, um, as I'm sure it did everyone else. Yeah, do you remember Bush said, um, 48 hours, yeah. you know, that was the headline. And we'd yep. print things like that on, on, on screen, and, yeah. and everyone would just go crazy. So we realized that this was a powerful tool for communication. 
But we didn't want to kind of preach, you know, war is bad, war is bad. We wanted to keep it in the, in the, in the kind of frame of mind that this is, real, this is information. Yeah. And, you can, and every day we uh, updated statistics, so you can see the only statistic that didn't change is actually at the bottom. Yeah, weapons of mass destruction found zero. <laughs> um, we also set up a website where people could um, uh, uh, well, write a message. In and yeah, they could write a message um, and, and, and post it to the show that they were, they were going to go to or a show that their friend was at. And then, and then we just displayed these messages. And there was no censorship yeah. either. We decided let's just put up what's on, what's happening. Of course, we're funneling the information in, so there's a kind of censorship because we're choosing the things we think are interesting. But in terms of, of this, this track, which was really just those, just those messages people had put up, people realized, because friends had been to the gig before, oh, look, my friends are going tonight. So they'd be putting things in like, oh, hi, hi, Jimmy, or hi, Mum, and things like that. And you could hear people in the audience going, whee! <laughs> in big groups over there, like really excited because their message had come up. And again, this reinforced this feeling that we try to create that yeah. this information it came from the people and it was yeah. going back. To I mean, the, the idea was that we wanted the, the audience to feel a part of the show. You know, whether it's to, through information that's localized or with information that that they're inputting. So we're just going to watch some very. Uh, we're going to talk about the quality of this in a minute and tell you how important it is to document the work, which is something very important. But at the time, we were more concentrating on making the thing work because um, the techniques we use to make this show, we're going to discuss in a minute, uh, were quite complicated. And this just gives you a sense of what it is all about. As we said, <laughs> the, uh, the video quality wasn't brilliant. I mean, this was six years ago, um, but the images tell the story. And as Chris said, you know, we're, we're so busy kind of, you know, making the show work that you, you forget to document it properly. Yeah, so but this we, is we the first thing that we want to sort of, as a, as a bit of information to just say, is just, you know, um, it, of course, when you're creating something, a spectacle, an environment, uh, an installation, or a piece of work, if you don't document what you're doing during the process, then particularly if it's a performance piece, the performance is over, and if you don't document it carefully, and you'll see the quality of our documentation gets much better as things go on. Um, here's an interesting photo. This is actually in an old amphitheater in, um, uh, I think it was in Nîmes in France, a beautiful old Roman amphitheater. Part of it you couldn't go into because it's all falling down, but uh, uh, we want to show you this picture because it, it kind of shows quite nicely that you know, the, the, the uh, group experience of all the people in the audience here. And, um, th this particular piece that was uh, on the screen was just designed to look like a, um, a, a shopping receipt that you get from, from the supermarket. And actually the information there was things like um, um, M16 uh, costs uh, $48,000, um, a Sherman tank costs $142,000, and the, the things with your nuclear sub, uh, uh, missile, nuclear submarines, etc., going on and on and on, until it, it went through how much people were spending on the war in Iraq. And it went up and up and up and up, and then, of course, the United States were spending... Um, you know, in terms of what they spend per, per year on, on, the, on the, the war efforts, whatever people do on their military expenditure, was just far outweighing everything else. 
but that came in just at the critical time when the music sort of really kicked in this track. And um, um, Anyway, so in order to achieve this kind of thing, we, we couldn't use uh, off-the-shelf off conventional tools and software because they didn't exist. We wanted to um, take a MIDI time code from the band and, um, uh, and lock to the time code events, which is simply printing text. It was all about typography. Um, and using this screen as a medium, we designed all the fonts, as we'd said. Um, so, and plus, we had to create a new show every day. So we created this toolkit, which is a MIDI controller here. Um, and uh, there you can see the control system here, which is our first piece of uh, real-time software. Um, and um, uh, there's a timeline and this, that, and the other. Anyway, the, um, this was a solution to the problem, which was we needed a real-time software, which was pre-sequenced, locked to a time code, but it was reading text files. And the text files, as long as they had the same name every day, the content could change. Therefore, we could create a new show every day, although the, 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 the content changed, but the sequencing would be the same. Um, so we'd say, you know, making your own tools is very important if you want to do something different. So that's a, another thing. Mm -hmm. And the craft of creating them also teaches you the process of making the tool itself teaches you something new. Mm -hmm. So this is where um, Ash, uh, Ashraf Nehru come into the picture. He's the third director of UVA. Unfortunately, he can't be with us today. Um, and uh, he, he joined the team. He, he created the, the, the software. Um, my background, as you know, is more in art direction, and Chris is in technical production. And before this, um, this point in time, I, I was used to working with just other designers with very similar skills to myself. So it was a very, very interesting process to all of a sudden work with kind of people with very different skills, skill sets to me. I mean, I think this is becoming more commonplace now, people to collaborate with, with, with different um, people with different disciplines. But <clears throat> for us, it's, it's, it was re really interesting in, in, in our world. Well, it was and our production equal. and software yeah. are equal in the creative process. Yeah. That said, there's now 18 yeah. of us and, um, and people. And, um, what you'll notice here is that there's not many people with the same background, and that's very important for us. It's, it's important as a, there's a diverse mix of, of skills, and, and this allows us to move into different areas and, 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 and collaborate in, in new and interesting ways. Okay, so, um, so we've actually now just uh, um, completed five tours for Massive Attack now, so you know, we're really proud to have been invited back by them again and again and again. And um, by the third tour for Massive Attack, um, we, we wanted to create something more sculptural. And we, we realized that uh, you know, pixels in, a, in an LED screen or even your computer monitor, that it's just a light. And um, so we're thinking you know, lights are pixels, or pixels are lights. So what, what, if you just sort of get rid of the, the, the differentiation between these two things, you could start doing something more sculptural. And um, you know, also we said before, thinking of the medium first and designing the medium and then making your content for the medium is a very different approach than making video editing or VJing or something and then putting it on a screen. So <clears throat> what we did for the um, third tour, which was in 2006, was we, we found this, um, this lighting fixture, which is up there at the top. Uh, it's called a Chroma Q color block. It's, got quite big fat pixels and they shine light out, it's very bright and if you put a bit of smoke in the atmosphere you get these beams. Um, uh, so we, we thought let's create a sculptural form, almost like a breaking wave um, and designed a system which could hold these, these, um, these lighting fixtures to create a low resolution grid. Um, and the low resolution grid you can see in the top left and bottom right in production rehearsals, we're experimenting with smoke and stuff and the angles of the, the beams. We wanted to use them as lights to light the band, but also as a, as a screen, and it was very effective. Mm. The other thing to point out here, this, wasn't a, this, tour, this tour was very short. It was just for festivals. It wasn't to support a new album like the last big tour, and so it had to be floor standing and, uh, to accommodate... Um, the, the fast transition of coming on and off a yeah. stage. When you're doing, say, tours and festivals, and we're going to get onto this, how you design things for touring and moving from one space to the next, and, you know, in this case, at the first part, we're going to be talking about bands and stuff. Um, 
um, it is very, very difficult. So, so anyway, the, the, the content we created, again, we created it specifically for this screen, you know, thinking of each and every pixel. Now, how many pixels is 128 pixels by 12 pixels? So yeah. when we're actually creating content, we're looking at our high-definition monitors at little things like this and going, well, what's that, that going to look like? Yeah. So, um, uh, so eventually, we, we ended up developing our own visualization tools as well, which we'll show you a bit of that. Um, but the, the, um, the toolkit also involved lots of generative graphics, which could just be triggered on the beat. Um, and we're going to see just a little video here of what that looks like. And uh, luckily, Massive Attack are a band that don't mind being silhouetted in most of the uh, performances. Not many bands that uh, do that freedom to make such great choices. And you can see here the, the beams, they look, almost look like they're kind of moving lights, but they are just static lights. Just animating across the That's a very hard building one. So it's it's so good. Good. Uh, one other thing you'll notice here is that everybody in the audience is Okay, so, so, so um, designing for tours, um, it's a very interesting process because um, in, in some cases, if you're a big band, you know, you've got your whole big stadium like you two, you get in there the day before, you spend all your time rigging all the kit and you can take time doing that. Um, but if you're doing a festival tour or you have to one gig after the next, you've got to wheel it in in between one band and the next. So you have to design things so that they will fit in a tight space in a truck. And this actually drives the, um, the design in some ways. Um, this is a, a picture of the most recent tour we've done. Again, we've kept a low profile video element, but this time these LED panels are very high resolution. Um, and uh, we designed them into this structure here, which is um, uh, a, a, a series of strips. It's a louvered screen, and it's a modular design, which means that you can put it onto a big stage or a small stage. Um, it, and here, here's a little picture of um, how it all folds down mm. into a little box. Because the tour so, manager might say, you know, I've got a truck this size. I can get yeah. this many boxes on. You know, and, and the... Uh, these things really do end up shaping what you actually can do. Yeah. There's so many, so many constraints that actually um, end up defining the design in many ways. Um, and for example, the, the space on a truck, you know, if you take, if you've got one extra box left over, you need a whole other truck. And that means a whole other truck, a whole other driver, a whole other hotel room, more money all over the place, you know. So the, 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 the finance that you've got, you know, the budget really drives the creative process. Anyway, so I, this, I'm going to just uh, whiz through this because. Um, uh, we need to move on, but this is uh, just a few slides. This screen acts as one part light sculpture, um, video screen, and what's interesting here, we've, we've actually, uh, these louvers allow light to flow through, so you get lovely kind of lighting effects. Um, and sometimes there's a combination of both. There's, there's lights behind it and color on the screen. And the, the band we're interested in, obviously, uh, the kind of text uh, concepts and, and, and this tour, they, they, they were kind of 
focusing on more like human rights and political. Yeah. I mean, massive like attack are quite a political organism. You know, they really hold up to their values and stuff. Um, we're we're going to have a look at this movie, but scroll through because um, this is only like about a, 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 a twentieth of. Well, we've, we've got to go to. You know, don't we have that stuff? Mm-hmm. Okay, so um, so yeah, I mean, just generally, you know, um, we're really interested in black space as well, and you'll see this this a lot as we go through through the installation work we're doing. Um, and um, Matt, I think we was most interested in seeing something from around here onwards. I've been here forever. <laughs> So you could change the, the text files on a daily basis and, and the band would often have an idea and you know, they read something in the newspaper and wanted to, wanted to uh, pick out a particular topic, they were able to do that. So it acted more like a kind of message board. Um, what I think is interesting about this movie as well is something we, we, we discovered first, quite early on. It's not just about the content. Of course, sometimes content is very important and mostly it's the most important thing. But in this case, we're doing a live performance. It's about the band. It's about the, the stage set. It's also about the relationship between that and the audience. And what we really liked about this, this setup we did, which was really a progression from the first few tours we did, which was the fact that using lights and in a sculpture way fills the space above the void between the audience and the bands and I think this, this kind of really shows it. it's a very low screen it's only really this high but um, with all the lighting and video effects it just fills the space it's really quite impressive so this was um, that content there you just saw was when we um, we just passed the uh, uh, the t- detention of uh, Bill for uh, 42 days, which is the highest in the, in, in the world. Yeah, we're, we're allowed to hold people for 42 days without any any uh, reason in the UK for some reason. And uh, really, that's what Massive Attack were trying to drive through this, this thing. So, um, again, you know, we're representing the band's sort of whole ethos, you know, their political views. So it's a sensitive area, and um, uh, we hope we, we've done that in the right way. So we've gone on to work with many bands, many different bands, um, big and small, and we will continue to do so. But at the same time as all this was happening in the first couple of years, we were also experimenting with our own kind of installation art. Um, and this is going to now we're going to talk about more about that, um, and we're going to talk about Monolith. Um, Monolith was a, 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 um, a one-night installation. We were approached by 1.0 Film Festival, which some of you might be familiar with to create a, 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 an installation that responded to one of the museum spaces. Um, we walked around the galleries and they've got these incredibly ornate galleries uh, with artifacts from all around the world which have, been, uh, which have taken thousands of years to uh, make and develop. Um, so we, we, we felt that how can you create a work in such galleries and we were instantly uh, attracted to the garden space because it was beautifully open uh, it had this incredibly ornate uh, backdrop of this Victorian building. And it was also in the centre yeah, of the whole space, yeah. wasn't it? So, um, so we, this was a one-night thing, again, so we, we create, decided to create this kind of monolith that uh, sat in the middle of the, of the garden. And we wanted to create an installation that felt like it was alive, like it had a soul, um, and we wanted it to react to people's presence. And, and, and also uh, detect when people would approach it. So here's a close-up of someone getting really close. And um, not many people actually see these kind of LED technologies on such a scale, really up close and personal. And um, I think people are just like moths to a light bulb. They're kind of naturally attracted to this kind of light force and um, proves really successful. We were only expecting about um, you know 20 people to turn up and immediately everyone just rushed into the garden and and there was about 200 people in there from the beginning till the end and uh, we had to create these barriers because it, uh, the interaction model wasn't working properly because it detected how far away you were from the monolith and played calm sounds the further away you were and then very kind of angry and angry colors angry sounds the, f- the closer you were and because we didn't anticipate so many people there 
um, our interaction model fell to pieces, basically. Yeah. And everyone was going straight up to the front yeah. and, and made it the, the most angriest yeah. it possibly I mean, it was, just so screaming, like, oh. it was just screaming at people, and they were going, oh, it's so beautiful. <laughs> and, uh, um, so in some ways, it was, it was a bit of a failure in terms of the interaction system. Just Here's another little movie, which is um, badly documented the game. Um, and this just kind of shows you roughly what it, the vibe was. So we're scaring children, which is good. We like to do that. There's a child here. <laughs> so, so you can see it's a fairly short movie. Again, we, we didn't document it very well. It's just it's so tense putting this thing together in just one night. and. Uh, we, we just had a budget of a hundred pounds, which was enough to rent a van, you know, and, and um, we, we borrowed some LED and really threw it together. But, uh, but anyway, we learned a lot from yeah. those mistakes. And <clears throat> so even though Monolith in some ways was a, a victim of it, its own success, it broke a lot of records for the v and And, and uh, strangely, they phoned us up and asked us back to do a, a, a three month piece um, that lasted for, you know, weeks rather than hours. So the lesson is it's okay to make mistakes, but make sure you learn from them um, in the sense that the interaction model didn't, didn't actually work. So when we thought about um, making uh, a three-month piece, we had to solve the interaction problem, um, particularly when groups of people approach, uh, approach the installation. So we come up with this idea, um, which was like a grid of monoliths. This is, this is volume. Um, and it's, it's basically a field of columns of light uh, and sound, and that each uh, column would individually react to your proximity. And this was actually, um, your prox proximity was detected by this camera, which you can see at the, at the top there. It was an infrared camera, and it, um, it, it kind of scanned the grid. Um, Chris, do you want to talk about yeah. that? The, um, yeah, so, so the interaction model here is, as, as Matt was just saying, you know, firstly, we, we need to make sure people could enter and approach the whole installation from all sides, you know, because you can't control people. Mm -hmm. So you have to let them do what they want to do first. Um, secondly, we, we knew that, um, you know, that the lighting conditions using an optical motion sensing system can be completely erratic. So we used an infrared um, uh, lighting system and infrared technology on the camera. Um, this is actually um, an image um, from our 3D visualizer. It's a piece of software we've been writing in-house, developed from the first system that we, we first showed you. Again, with the timeline at the bottom, but it's a three-dimensional visualizer. Um, we hooked this up to the motion detection camera and these little white uh, pucks, we call them, actually move around as, as you move around. It's all completely real time. And your proximity to each column would adjust the um, energy level, if you would, in, in each scene. So <clears throat> anyway, to develop the whole thing was really quite complex. Uh, again, we picked an LED uh, block, which you can see a top view of here uh, in the bottom left. Um, that would fill this column, um, and at the top there's a speaker, so it's an integrated LED column um, with a speaker. There was uh, 46 columns and uh, six sub bass underneath, so really it's a 46.6 surround sound system uh, with 1,224 individual blocks. Um, the, um, <clears throat> So each column could make its own sounds. Here's some behind the scenes shots of us uh, rigging all of this stuff. Um, and, um, uh, and, and us actually uh, um, manufacturing these, these aluminium columns. Uh, incidentally, to, to make one of these columns, you have to uh, extrude it through this die. Um, and to, to fire the big machine up, you have to put a ton of aluminium in there and fire it up to 800 degrees centigrade. And um, we only needed 46 of these columns. Um, and they, they, they did it wrong the first time and then the next time and uh, it, it really put some stress and strain on us because we, we'd, we'd rented this whole warehouse facility so that we could build it. And here you can see all of these LED blocks and the cables and we were like thinking, God, what have we done? We've, mm -hmm. we've got this huge kit of parts and, um, <laughs> and not think, only that, you know, you know how it works. Massive so. Attack, we actually commissioned them this time, which was quite nice, to make this sound uh, a field, field of sound and there's I think there's actually 48 columns, and they're like, what the hell does 48 um, 
you know, different sound channels sound like yep. in one place, and we're like, yep. well, we don't know. That's why we've employed it, employed yeah. you. So, so there but was th a that learning was, process for both. Yeah, of I mean, us, but I mean. that was kind of the thrill of putting something like this together. You know, it's the unknowns, and it it yep. is a certain amount of risk taking, but um, sometimes you've got to take risks. Uh, yeah, in fact, here, here's some of the audio cables here um, and the audio amplification system there. We, we were fortunate enough to get in touch with, um, well, Sony PlayStation were, were actually provided some of the money for this because they were doing the launch of Sony PlayStation in the UK. And um, we said to them, look, you know, we really need some help. Yeah. Can you speak to the car audio department? <laughs> um, and uh, they gave us all of these car audio speakers and these car, car audio amplifiers, which are all 12 volts. So... You know, there were there are, I think eight of them, and we had to have these huge, massive power supplies to drive them. Um, a, a, anyway, putting all this thing together was yeah. fairly complex, as you'll see on the next um, picture here, which was our initial control system uh, during the process. Um, in this warehouse, incidentally, they had this fantastic grid in the ceiling, so we could walk around the grid and look down on the whole thing. Um, it's one of our favourite photos, but um, it took us seven days and nights pretty much working 24-7 in, in sometimes in shifts, sometimes people weren't, weren't sleeping just to get it ready. Um, but it was a temporary, temporary installation, this, because we, we had to build the control system. And, and here you can see all the electronics on the stage. Ultimately, it goes all built under the stage. But this was the first time it was switched on. And um, it was just a great moment to see it all suddenly working and thinking, God, we really made something fantastic here. Where are we going to put all the cables? Yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, look, here's a little time lapse that we shot just to show you, um, you know, how, how, um, how it all went together. Um, of course, uh, the, the stage on the, that you see here, this is a temporary stage. The real stage is on the left. And they were still welding all of the stage components together. And we just temporarily fixed everything here um, on the right. So we actually built it um, twice. Um, during, during this week-long process and then had to go and install it in the V&A. So we built it three times in one week, which is actually a luxury that we've never had since. Um, and we'll get, on, we'll get on to that sort of thing later. Um, but, uh, yeah, you can see how all the LED components are all starting to come online here. And, um, and then the, the, the second, the real stage gets taken out and, um, uh, and, and then we had to move because Christopher oh, this Burr, is a night time when Christopher the singer of Lady in Red had also rented this space and uh, we had to move so but um, not only that listen to his music for yeah, two yeah, days exactly, in the yeah. studio from the warehouse next door <laughs> um, okay so uh, yeah so anyway so that goes in there then we move to the next space let's just see this is quite interesting how, how it all comes together and what comes apart yeah I'm thinking. Right. And time was really pressing here because they, I was saying that the, the aluminium columns, they'd made some mistakes, they didn't quite work properly. The LED wasn't fitting in properly and we were getting bits of tape and sticking it all together and it was looking a little hairy whether we'd make it in time. But the columns came back all black and shiny, powder coated, and we literally got it turned on. The band came in and went, wow, that's good, and then we had to take it down. Um, and then when we, when we finally um, um, installed it in the V&A, you'll see there it's gone. Bye-bye. And, and anyway, so then here, here we are in, in the V&A itself. What you're doing is looking from the point of view of the motion detection camera, which ultimately goes there. So this is the view you'll see. Watch the stage. Did you see we had to just shift it like that a second ago? Gink because um, you know, you're doing a site-specific installation. The orientation of your piece to the surrounding architecture is very important. And if we had it slightly off by half a degree, it would have just looked awful. Um, so we had to get that right. And then, then there it is in, in the space. Yeah. So this is our volume when it was uh, actually in the V&A garden, um, grand space. Um, about the actual um, work itself, the, the, the content was uh, structured in two, tape, uh, two main movements, um, and there were six interludes that uh, acted as transitions. Um, and as we said earlier, your proximity to the column modulated the music and the visuals. So this is a video of the installation in situ. Um, the first minute or so, it's not interactive, it's just to show the full glory of the installation, and then it will go into an interactive mode. 
and make cheap infrared lights. Get some 500 watt halogen uh, light, um, light bulbs you put outside your garage and put some red and blue gel in front of it. That works. You have to replace the gels every day. So What was interesting uh, was during this piece, um, no one knew how it worked, you couldn't see the camera. So people were stamping on the floor, uh, clapping, uh, jumping up and down, uh, tapping the columns, rubbing them. Um, I told a few people, oh there's a motion detection camera just up there, you can just see it. But uh, there was something magical about it because the, the mechanism was hidden. But that, that, I mean, the, the, the space really helped as well. You know, it's, it's kind of a once in a lifetime opportunity to to create something in a V&A garden, um, and it has a kind of magical quality anyway. Um, so here you can see this is kind of when it's interactive. I think there's just two people in the grid. Um, really kind of interesting to explore on your own or with groups. There were how many scenes? Two main scenes, yeah. and, and th this is one of the interludes that we were talking about. That would kind of um, just break up the sequence a bit. And uh, it's one of those things where we were kind of just scratching the surface of what was possible with this kind of volumetric screen. Um, uh, you know, great art is never finished; it's always abandoned, as they say. This last um, leap is what would happen if uh, no one was in the in the installation. It acted as a kind of calling signal, as it were. This here. So, <clears throat> for us, this wasn't a game. This was a, uh, and it, it wasn't even interactive per se. It was more of a kind of responsive installation. The, you know, the installation constantly gave you feedback, responding. And another thing that we recognized was some people didn't actually even want to go into the grid. They were quite happy just watching other people. Um, and, and some people obviously wanted to go into, into the grid and experience um, the sound and light. And in many ways, we see this as kind of dissolving the space between the stage and the audience. Um, uh, and in some ways, this is a kind of continuation of, a, of, of, of designs that we do for live performance, but allowing the audience to be the performers, as it were. So another thing we noticed that there were hundreds and hundreds of pictures being posted on Flickr. And um, as Chris touched on earlier, PlayStation, PlayStation actually sponsored this. It was a commercial um, project. And, and, and we were surprised that they didn't want it branded at all, but I think they kind of understood the power of of, um, of the internet and, and, and how online communities could share pictures of an experience and it would generate interest in that way. And this piece now tours. Uh, this is um, in Hong Kong. It's actually been in Taiwan, uh, South Bank. Uh, where else has it been? It's currently in a, in a warehouse in Melbourne ready to go into, um, what's the square? Federation Square. Federation Square. And uh, we're currently talking to um, Sydney Opera House, and hopefully it's going to be in front of Sydney Opera House later this year. So, but we'd um, love to bring it to America. Yeah, if there's anyone. maybe LA. <laughs> if there's anyone out there with the money, <laughs> not for us to put it on. Of course.
Okay, so um, so one thing we, we learned from this is it's important to take advantage of available technologies. And it doesn't mean necessarily using the technology for the technology's sake. Uh, but it is obviously important to experiment and keep researching and keep developing ideas and concepts because you never know when they may uh, uh, be an opportunity for you to use it in a project. Um, the internet, for example, is a, is a tool that you can use uh, for creative purposes, but also research development, but also camera tracking systems, which we used in volume. And uh, here's a picture of, a, of another uh, camera system. It's a stereoscopic three-dimensional camera. It's two lenses. It works the same as the human eyes and the human brain. So it just calculates in real time the distance between an object based on the comparing the two images. Um, so uh, it was originally developed for military purposes. And uh, in the next project, we're going to talk about how we use this camera to create another installation piece, which is also touring there, I believe. <coughs> I know it. <laughs> uh, this piece is called uh, Echo. And um, it was actually, uh, again, a one-night-only uh, piece, which we uh, did for uh, the Tate Modern. The Tate Modern in London was doing a rehang uh, where they moved all the art pieces and want to celebrate uh, this by doing a performance and a, a, a little drinks uh, event in the main turbine hall. Um, so we were, um, we were uh, contacted by, by an agency to create a piece and we decided to do a performance piece. And we found a circus performance uh, company who do um, dance, contortionism, um, all sorts of um, uh, sort of physical motion. Um, and uh, we were really intrigued by doing something with the body and replaying those, the motion of the body. And we, we'd been experimenting with this camera in the studio and thought this is a perfect opportunity. Um, so we used this 3D camera to, to explore their dance in three dimensions. Um, it allowed us to look at their bodies and their movements in, fr from a different perspective. Um, the, the screen was right at the far end of the turbine hall. I don't know if anyone, have, uh, any of you have been to the Tate Modern in, in London, but it's such a huge space, like a massive, massive gallery. And we, we put an eight meter tall LED screen at the far end and, a, and, a, and a, the performers are just there at the base. Small camera just hidden out of the way and uh, we, we choreographed all of these 3D moves uh, with the camera. Um, and then we, there was a real sort of sense of um, interplay between the performers and our choreographed moves. So really, we sort of drove the choreography with, with what we could do with the technology. And the, the um, choreography that they, that they performed also drove the, th the motions of the camera. So it really kind of worked off each other during the, the rehearsals. Um, and um, so, so what's important about this is that we ended up doing this in real time. What people could see in the real space, the beauty of the motion, we replayed it in real time, but we translated it using a different language almost, but something people could understand. And um, we're just going to play this movie because it's really quite beautiful. We totally realised that this technology isn't perfect, and uh, we're, in, we're actually interested in the, the, the non-perfect aspect of it, you know, the imperfections.
there were also uh, 40 cherry blossom trees here that they'd um, taken crazily enough. I mean, the, the, the rehang was sponsored by UBS, and bankers back in those days, I suppose, could do anything. <laughs> and they, um, they, they actually froze these or chilled these um, English uh, cherry blossom trees because it was a sense of renewal. It was about rehanging, so it was a spring. got them from Japan or something. Or they did they? Yeah, I don't, don't know. Months. But the, crazily enough, they put these, these 40 cherry blossom trees in blossom into a refrigerated warehouse. And then, uh, because it was some days or weeks after, the, the uh, blossom should have fallen. Uh, but they got the trees out, unfortunately, about a day early and put them in the space. And by the time everyone came in, all the blossom had just started to go brown and just <laughs> hang off a little bit. We were like, hmm, that says that's, that's a completely different message. <laughs> but still, it was really impressive. And um, anyway, the, the, this is a photo. Uh, this is another piece that's, that's uh, now going on tour, we were very pleased to say. And uh, this is a photo of this same piece um, in a, an opera house in, um, in uh, Como in Italy, near, uh, in the north of Italy. And again, we're working with the same dance troupe, and we're, we're actually reworking this piece a little bit with new, new moves and choreography and slightly different musical score. So yeah, as Chris was saying earlier, um, we're, we're constantly in a state of uh, research and development, always looking out for new toys to play with. Um, this this uh, movie shows a, uh, a film that we made using a 1,000 frames a second digital camera, and it allows you to actually distort time in a completely fluid way. As you can see, his hand, if it's still, is actually not moving, whereas his head's going very wobbly. And, um, and these things are very, really kind of compelling and, and, and such fun to play with. Um, and, and I guess most of our work is pretty serious, but we do have these kind of um, fun kind of one, one-off event, um, things that we get involved with where we can actually implement this. And um, the next movie you're going to see is actually um, a movie shot of people using this uh, technique in events where we had a, about eight of these mirrors displayed as a kind of digital halls, hall of mirrors. And it's amazing what you can make people do. I had no idea they were being filmed by them. Okay, that's enough of that. It goes on for ages. <laughs> but um, like in all our work, we, we, we're really interested in, in kind of immersing people into the moment and, and making them forget about the past and the future. And, and, and we think it's quite a powerful um, place to, to put people in. Um, next project is Hereafter, which um, in a way is a, a, a kind of um, a organic continuation of, of this experiment, experimentation with this camera. Um, we were asked to take part in a joint exhibition that took place in this um, place called Belsay Hall, which is in the uh, north of England and, and, and is managed by the English Heritage. It's a very historical building. Lots of families, generations have uh, actually lived there. It was actually used in World War II as, World War II as a secret uh, operations base. Um, you can see here the kind of worn um, stairs, the worn st stone. Uh, 
the room that we chose to install our installation was actually the old servants' quarters. Um, the whole place had a, a sense of time and history. It was everywhere. Um, and we're, we're, we're always interested in, in different ways of seeing. And we wanted to come up with different ways of looking at familiar things for this, for this exhibition. Um, so we start, started to do some research. And uh, we were particularly interested in people that kind of were experimenting with um, um, creating works that dealt with time, emotion. And this, this uh, sculpture here um, is actually a sculpture made out of a period of time uh, confined into one moment. And equally, E.G. E. Mary uh, experimented with multiple exposures um, to, to give a better understanding of c continuous motion. So we thought it would be interesting to play with the user's sense of time um, and to add something that appeared to be a mirror at first glance. You can see it's actually a, a monitor. Um, the 100, one, sorry, 1,000 frame a second camera is actually positioned at, at the top, so it's capturing your, um, the, the motion in the room. Uh, we also added several video fragments uh, as these kind of bits of furniture uh, you can see in this, this image. They weren't actually physically in the room, but they would appear every now and then. Did you not go and rent them from an antique the local, store? Yeah, yeah. We just want to rent these uh, yeah. chairs for an and afternoon. Didn't you get a chicken as well to run across the floor? We did, we did. The secret. Um, so using the technology we used in the Hall of Mirrors experiment, we, would, um, we, we, we presented people uh, with fragments of their own history, so that we would capture them. They, it might be playing... Uh, the motion from 10 seconds ago, one minute ago, 10 minutes ago, if, if they stayed that long. But it also presented uh, people that had been in the room before because we were interested in the history of the space and it was very quite eerie in the space, so it was almost like ghosts in the room. Oh. There's me. Um, so we're going to watch some footage of this. This is a silent movie. And you can see I'm, I'm approaching the mirror here and I'm so slowly fading in. And even though I'm moving, I'm actually leaving myself behind. And it's really quite a spooky feeling. It's almost um, like you're leaving yourself. Um, and I don't know if you can see in this, uh, in this frame, but things start appearing behind me and, um, and, and I'm reappearing. Uh, we actually wrote an algorithm to control this. So it was the computer that controls this, comparing all the frames and seeing how much motion, how much difference between one frame and the next. So it would randomly decide to play an ancient piece of history or recent history or immediate history or play back in real time. Um, incidentally, this 1,000 frame a second camera, if you record something at 1,000 frames a second and play it back over standard, well, at least in the, in the UK with PAL video at 25 frames a second, that lasts for four minutes. So a single second, you could stretch over four minutes mm. almost. So the, we kind of left this to happen organically by putting an algorithm mm. in that would mm. choose whether to do something based on the motion. And of course, we're watching a 25 frames a second film here, so you, you don't get any understanding of what this actually feels like. Yeah. And it's quite, quite, I guess it relates to a lot of our work. It's about creating experiences um, and, and, and being immersed in, in something. But it's, um, yeah, it's, it's an interesting installation. So move on. Uh, yeah, so... Um so we don't just create um, installations designed for people to come in and experience, um, whether it be on stage for a band or for people to actually physically involve themselves in, in a gallery or a space. Um, we also have had the opportunity to create uh, some music videos, and we're going to talk now about uh, uh, the Battles video. Battles are from New York, I think. Yep. And uh, this video um, uh, called Tonto, uh, we were really interested in creating an installation so that we could film a band in it, mm -hmm. film it, and then present the film. So mm -hmm. no one would ever see the installation, but, but we wanted to create, the, get the, capture the sense of this excitement that we've been try, trying to communicate with you, but, uh, but on film. So we filmed this in, in high definition. And, and anyway, we, we thought that um, 
Um, we do this uh, experiment in, in an outdoor environment, somewhere just completely off the wall where people wouldn't really understand quite where it is. And uh, this is actually in a, a slate mine in Wales, in northern Wales. Um, it, it was quite interesting because uh, it looks really organic. It almost looks like you're on Mars, but it's really, um, you know, an artificial location created by man's intervention. You know, they've taken these massive machines and smashed the place to bits, and there's bits of debris lying everywhere and, and putting these, these structures, just a strip of LED on a, on a stand um, into this space, it's like a complete, complete um, sort of juxtaposition of old and new, digital and analog. Well, and chaos just, and order yeah. really. And yeah. that's really, that inspiration comes from the band's music. If you ever listen to their music, it, from the first listen it sounds really kind of, what the hell's going on here? Is there any structure to this? But there is actually um, a lot of structure in there, so yeah. in, a, in a way it kind of uh, but took the, inspiration from that. And, and this, this regular grid that we put in, this sort of linear arrangement um, and, and regular grid, it really, really lent itself really, really well to their sort of uh, rigid and mathematical structure of the music. But, but putting this into this place really we thought was just fantastic because of the contrast there. Um, so we wanted to focus on that, but, but not only that, we wanted to focus on the energy of the band. Mm -hmm. Before we, we um, d created the piece, or, or we had to write a full treatment, of course, and submit it to the record company, and they had obviously a number of treatments to choose from, and um, fortunately, um, uh, Battles had been to our website and said, we want to work with these guys anyway, so I think we may, may have won it, but, but um, we, we knew we had a good idea, at least. Um, but what we noticed when we were doing our research before we submitted the, the brief was that the bands are always looking at each other. When they're playing on stage, they're communicating, like non-verbal communication as they're playing their instruments. And we wanted to capture that somehow, the energy. So, so putting them into this space, hmm. and then that uh, was really important. So we captured the performance. But then we said, look, you've got to play the track all night. We wanted to capture them from dusk till dawn. Like, so we could say, look, they're still there in the morning, like mm. hitting their instruments and going for it to capture the intensity and the dedication. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a challenge really for them and, and for us, uh, this performance. So this is me um, trekking through the, the Welsh mountains with lovely socks on. Um, and this is one of the things I love about our, our job. You know, we really do get to travel around the world. We, we go to amazing places. And, Wales. Uh, yeah, Wales. Well, <laughs> Wales is actually amazing, it is. If you, especially the Welsh mountains. But, you know, we, we get away from the computer screen. Uh, because I, before we started UVA, I was a graphic designer. There's nothing wrong with that. I love graphic design. But I was frustrated by just being behind this you know, screen all day, and um, you know we we really um, are lucky to to do such projects. So once we found our location, um, or what we thought was our location, we we you have to do a load of lighting tests, and this is just an image um, showing that we just a few modules that we took up there. Um, one of the biggest challenges really was that Wales rains a lot. You know, it's really really wet, and um, it's obviously quite a gamble to do something outside. And, um, and but we went for it anyway. Um, this image shows um, a picture of a motion control system that we made out of Lego. And wood. <laughs> and um, gaffer tape. It allows us to do stop motion uh, on, uh, whilst in motion. Um, you know, the budget for this was not very big at all. And, and, and so, the, but we like doing this. We, might <clears throat> we like making our own software. We like making our own uh, machines, uh, robots. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a part of the fun, really. And particularly when, when the budget is very limited, you know, you've got to get creative. Um, and uh, not only is there wood, gaffer tape, and whatever else there, but there's a lot of Lego involved in this. Um, there's this le um, robotic Lego. You can uh, control motors and stuff. So we program that in. And really what you're seeing here is a stop-motion camera um, oh, and uh, that um, is, is on a, a thread screw. Uh, so it progresses from left to right just a few millimeters precisely. Takes a picture. Takes a picture and then moves on again. Takes a picture and moves on again. And then that high def image, you can then pan and scan um, because it's a 4K image mm -hmm. from a digital SLR. You pan and scan inside there. But it does feel like we kind stuff. of make these inventions, use them once and then make something else. Yeah. You know, we, I know. We should, um, well, maybe we should have another slide in here saying, um, don't, don't forget to use all your good ideas again. Um, but uh, yeah, one of the, the massive challenges was digging holes in slate quarries 
with your bare hands. It's uh, t to try and get columns straight. Yeah, don't forget your spade. <laughs> well, you need more than that. You need a pickaxe. But yeah, it was a real challenge to um, to actually realise this uh, installation. Um, but again, it adds to the, the fun, and, I guess. And it so, did it not rain for seven days? And on the <clears throat> or six days, it was almost quite biblical. It rained for six days, and on the seventh day, yeah. the band arrived and the skies cleared. And it was like, oh, thank and you. they were only there for one night because they were in between yeah. two gigs. But, so. but fortunately, as you'll see from the the movie, um, it meant that everything was covered with water. It was just glistening. There was reflections everywhere, and we we couldn't have faked that. Mm. Um, and uh, I think we're going to see the movie yeah. next. I mean, we're not going to show the whole movie because it's not like a pop uh, uh, video. It's not like three. It's an eight minute performance. It's more of a performance video. But here's some of it anyway. going to skip through some of this because it does go on a bit and um, I just want to go towards the end because I just want to show you how exhausted they are by the end of it it's quite mm. funny and some of the motion control bits actually yeah. it's going to be interesting also to know that the band are a big fan of the Pink Floyd um, video um, one of the comments um, where the whole gigs filmed in this big wanted to have this sense of big grand scale. So you can see the sun's coming up, and this is kind of pretty much all time. Probably shot this spell 20 times already. But it was on digital. We really like this kind of balloon feeling. We did actually test out the film, but it came out too creamy. We like this kind of slightly blue feeling to the whole thing. Very smart. 
So this is also one of the most uh, downloaded videos that uh, Warp Records have uh, produced, the record company. And in fact, because of the success of this video, we had to change our web server provider because um, we had a bill of over a thousand pounds one month because everyone was downloading this video from our website. Jeez. Um, but um, anyway, we were really quite pleased with, pleased with that project. Okay, so we're going to move on to a completely different project. This is another kind of um, light installation, uh, interactive installation piece. Uh, this is Contact, and uh, we were invited by the British Council in Japan uh, to create an installation to celebrate 150 years of diplomatic relationships between our countries. They were doing a whole year-long of events with scientists, movie makers, um, and performers. Uh, and we opened the whole festival with this installation. Um, it was at the base of uh, Mori Tower, um, and it's a site-specific floor-based installation. They originally wanted volume, but it wouldn't fit, and I don't think it would have worked here either because you can see in the peripheral vision there's restaurants and cafes, so it, if you were standing in volume, you'd have all this visual noise. So in many ways, that's why we created this floor-based installation. We wanted people to fall into um, a work and, and, and not just be in this busy space, this busy uh, shopping centre. The brief was to, um, to create a work that would engage all walks of life. You know, it, it had to uh, almost be fun to use for children, for um, anyone from any different background, culturally, all different ages. So we um, designed this thing that was easily accessible from all areas, and there's two viewing platforms here for people to kind of watch a performance, as it were. And there was a camera um, positioned above, again, to track people. But it wasn't really um, uh, just tracking people, uh, tracking people's movements. Not in the way that volume, volume was doing. This worked in a very different way. This is a, a screenshot of the optical flow um, software that takes a reading from the camera. So we're looking down onto the installation. You can see the tops of heads. And this is a very, very cl clever system. Um, it works with things called vector um, uh, motion. Uh, so these little arrows are telling uh, the camera which, or the computer, which way people are moving, how fast, um, and, and this allows us to do really interesting stuff with, with kind of um, gestures, so you can push things around, literally, quite literally. So as I said, unlike volume, which was based on proximity, uh, contact responds to human gestures. This uh, allowed us to simulate interesting physics-based physics simulations, so uh, things bouncing off each other that would seem really real, even though it's virtual. Again, this is not a game. This is more of a, an experiment of human interaction. Uh, but it was, it was more of a kind of fun play thing, really. Yeah, mainly because um, the, the, uh, the, the space had so many different types of people coming in and lots of people going shopping and this and the other, lots of kids. So we wanted it to be fun and engaging. Um, and uh, there's a little movie here which uh, we, we didn't film. <laughs> probably the worst piece of documentation we have here. It's a YouTube thing. It's from YouTube, but it shows um, some kids having a, a play in it. So we often I see children as perfect guinea pigs for interaction design. If, if, if kids enjoy it, you know you, you've, you've kind of got, some, you've got something. So we're just going to show uh, more documentation yeah, of the, that. Here's the proper movie. Um, the other thing to note, there was, um, there was uh, uh, eight channel surround sound system. Yeah. And so when you see people walk around, each um, graphic element that bounced together actually produced its own individual noise. So smaller elements would create higher pitched notes and bigger elements, like this one. Would, would create bassier notes. So it wasn't musical in any way, it was just a, more of a kind of sound responsive thing. But as you can see how really responsive this piece is because it's using these motion vectors rather than proximity. You know, the, you've got a complete sense of direction uh, and force. So, you know, in terms of the physics, uh, it would really work. And this is one of the reasons we chose these simple primitive shapes. We didn't want to detract from the actual effect itself. We wanted to make it very simple so people could understand it. And, um, you know, we. we 
We felt a bit confined by the space. We really want to do this on a really big canvas, maybe with projectors, so that people can really kind of um, explore space with, with more freedom. <clears throat> Another great thing about this space, it's right at the bottom of the Mori Tower. I don't know, again, if any of you have been to Japan, or indeed some of you are probably from Japan, but uh, the building used to be the tallest building in Tokyo until very recently, and the glass ceiling, you're on a glass platform standing above an LED screen here, but at the ceiling above you is a glass ceiling, so there was this kind of, you're compressed between these two glass walls, but then above you, going up into the sky, you know, something like 87 floors or 90 floors, is the Mori Tower itself. So this, you know, high-tech installations at the base of this really high-tech um, space, and it just felt just right in, in the place. <clears throat> it's also interesting how uh, different kind of societies actually are willing to, you know, play and experiment with these things. You do see subtle shifts. I mean, yeah. We did an um, installation in front of the Louvre in Paris, and it's, it's very performative. Yeah. And, uh, and in Japan, I think people are a little bit more reserved. Um, I mean, that's not generalising on culture, but you do see uh, subtle, uh, different behaviour patterns generally. But these guys are really enjoying themselves, and they loved it. Um, okay, so um, this is going to be project. the last project we're going to show you tonight, and then we're going to have some questions, I think, if people have any. Um, and uh, this last project um, we just installed uh, last week, so um, you're the first people to see it. There's one image on our website at the moment. Uh, it's called Chorus, and it was uh, a re uh, based on a request to um, uh, create a uh, a treatment for the opening of the Howard Assembly Rooms, which is a beautiful room in the Leeds Opera House. It had been closed for over 30 years, um, so, and I think there'd been something like 31 million pounds spent on this whole building. We didn't get that much money for it, <laughs> um, if only. Um, but uh, again, it's a site-specific response, and I think that's something that sort of goes uh, as a common theme through all of our works, you know, we're creating, looking at a space and creating a, a treatment for it. Um, again, um, beautiful old building, there's Leeds Opera House, and inside there there's a beautiful space, you'll see some photos in a minute. So um, the, the concept we're here is the Leeds Opera House, so you know, we've never, we've, as you can see we've worked with some dancers and performers and musicians of different kinds, but never with opera, and it uh, was interesting for us, so we, we wanted to find some kind of unifying theme between uh, opera or music and light. And uh, as we were doing our research, we, we you know, just loved the simple notion of a metronome. It's just so simple and beautiful, the sound of it, the way it moves. Um, but uh, in, because of the space, we couldn't do a metronome. So we thought, well, can we turn it upside down and make a pendulum? So um, we, we used that as a reference to musical score and the passage of time. Um, here is a, a planned view of the space on the left. And the red blobs are um, the eight pendulums which we installed. Um, and then on the right, you can see a side elevation of the five-meter-long pendulum with the mechanics at the very top with a, with a bob at the end, like a plumb bob. Um, and the, the guy there, the little uh, guy or lady at the bottom, just to show some scale. So in, in our initial um, concepts, we, we knew we had to fill this space and we had a limited budget. Again, going back to what we were discussing earlier, that the budget and the space defines the concept and the, the direction you're going to take. Um, we, we wanted these things to swing by 60 degrees. So this is a five meter long arm with an LED and a speaker in a box at the bottom and we had to make it swing. So we, we, we actually spent months experimenting with magnets and motors and this and the other. Because yeah, in many ways it's our first kinetic piece. Yeah, yeah, first piece first, that yeah we moved. We, yeah, all of our stuff um, up until now has been very, I mean the objects themselves are static but the content moves and we wanted to make an object that moved and the content stayed still. So. So this is another reason we chose this. But it was actually very difficult to, to achieve this. We, we finally made it. But another reason we wanted to do this 60 degree swing, which may not look like a lot here, but when you see the film in a second, it's really quite, quite interesting. But we wanted it to look dangerous as well, almost like 
should I walk underneath that thing? You know. Well, we wanted um, to also um, it, we wanted it to feel like an opera, so there would be moments of calm and beauty yep. and serene, yep. but there were also moments of danger, and and, yep. and, and, and and the music would kind of um, correspond with that, wouldn't it? That's right. Yes. So um, uh, anyway, so the system was really, really complicated, and I have to tell you, I don't know how it works. Um, our guys, some of those guys on that long list you saw earlier on spent months working on this thing, lots of late nights. Um, I understand there's something like 56 separate processes involved in making everything work. So, um, but in, an, in, in essence, the bob could move up and down. Although I have to be honest, it didn't work on the opening night, but it does now. We don't have film of it working. Um, and there's a sensor uh, to detect the position of the bob on the pendulum and sensors to detect where in the swing it was, how fast it was going, sensors to detect how quickly, how much energy was going to the motor. And all of this was fed through this um, complicated wiring uh, diagram here um, uh, to a mixture of systems. Um, there's a reactor, which was, we designed a sound tool in reactor. Um, to do the sound. We used open frameworks to control all of the sensor network and uh, we used a whole bunch of Arduino chips. I've seen some of the guys yesterday doing stuff with Arduino chips um, to control the, all of the sensors and all the motors and magnets. Um, and but this shows how the whole thing in some schematic and... Um, and we actually made our own LED boards as yeah, well. Yeah, you we know, everything, own. every single part of this was completely bespoke. Yeah, apart from the speakers, I think, was, yeah. and the Arduino chips. Um, okay, so this is one of our guys. He's actually Ali, our uh, architectural lighting designer, soldering stuff. So everyone does get muck mucking in here. You can see one of the motors here, and I think he's soldering up uh, something or other. Um, <laughs> who, who knows what that bit is? Um, and on, on the right, you can see the, the first prototype uh, in, in, uh, the, in the workshop. Um, he, here's a quick screen grab of the Open Frameworks program, which... Um, might look a little bit messy, but uh, the, the purpose of this is on the right there to visualize the po exact position of the pendulums in 3D. Um, on the left, all of these graphs are showing the exact position of the pendulum in time, and the purpose really is to make each um, peak and trough match perfectly, um, which is very difficult because each pendulum was slightly different. The wind resistance to each um, pendulum would affect the, the amount of the energy you need to put in there and, yeah. and we were putting little bits of lead weights in there and trying to get this thing to compensate for any discrepancies in the system and um, but this tool was really initially designed to uh, give us a, an idea of how it might work as well a pre-visualization yeah. tool yeah um, uh, and there's just a quick um, th th there's nothing on there but this is the sound tool that was developed uh, in reactor I don't mm -hmm. know if you've used reactor but it's fairly useful if you'll some of the guys who I spoke to yesterday, guys and girls, would probably find it quite useful. But what um, was interesting about this piece, actually, um, we collaborated with a musician called Myra Calix, who, who made the, the musical score, and we developed this tool. And in, in many ways, the, the music determines the, the, the actual movement of the pendulums and the lights. So the, the, the whole experience is determined by the score. Yeah, and uh, she also um, created all of the sounds directly. This was the direct relationship was not in terms of, of motion and time and this pendulum, mm -hmm. make a reference to a metronome, but it was, it was um, uh, you know, thinking about a score of music and, and, uh, mm -hmm. and, and uh, she, she sampled, she went up to Leeds and sampled a load of the instruments, um, the violins, the cellos and the voices. So the, the, whole, uh, um, mm -hmm. the whole piece was orche orchestrated out of real sounds collected from the space. Um, he, here's, some, here's some shots of it moving in the opening night and all of these guys here are sipping their champagne thinking what, what on earth's happening. Um, but um, it, but it was once really you're, fascinating. Yeah, I mean, we've got a little video clip, but it really doesn't give you a sense of how it feels to be underneath these pendulums and to have sound being thrown around the room. Mm. It's just you get this kind of Doppler effect, yep. which is like it's quite almost like a car, a car going past really fast. Yep. You, but they were constantly boring. going. So, so as Matt was saying, so there's sounds that are actually driving the driving the pendulum. So one pendulum would swing, and it was almost like a bow on a violin. So as it moved, you'd hear, but you're hearing the sound moving away from you and back. And we haven't done a proper edit of this yet. This is actually just um, just someone taking a bit of footage, and he actually answers the phone in a minute, which is really embarrassing. 
But this gives you a, an idea. It's actually a 20 minute um, cycle. And this is just a, a couple of minutes. We've got to go back and shoot this properly, but we've got to show one new project. Any good film directors out there? But it is, it is such a beautiful hypnotic thing in the space. And there is a lot of variation of phase, and, and the audio actually triggers on, on very kind of precise points of. of the highest point of the pendulum. So the music actually changes. It's never the same because, as Chris said, all the pendulums are different weights. So they're slightly out of out of phase, but you can control them. But you can start to see the um, the height that they go to. It's really. Um, uh, I saw one comment in the book which I was really pleased with. It said, it "Made me very happy, but very scared." Uh, these are the range of emotions we like to, to tap into. doing the, the health and safety for us. <laughs> but uh, that gives you an idea. I mean, there's, there's a lot of subtle variation and, 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 and different moves and scenes, and, as we said. But and that, that was uh, shot um, during the opening afternoon. And uh, as, uh, as we've discussed in many of our projects, you know, sometimes things are late and you've got an opening to manage. And I believe since then it's been uh, improved considerably. But uh, I think that shows you an idea so uh, that's, of what um, it's like. That's uh, a little selection for you. You can go to our website. There's loads more projects. Thank you very much. So, um, thank you. Yeah, I think we're going to thank you so much. That was beautiful and powerful. Thank mm -hmm. you, Matt. Thank you, Chris. So we'll open the floor for questions. And please, we are um, uh, live streaming the uh, lecture, so we're going to take the questions on the microphone. So um, any questions? Hi there. Hi. Thank, thanks for the great talk. Uh, no I, I'm wondering if you can talk about uh, sound and audio with respect to interactivity and how you approach that, uh, b because it's very different from pre-recorded sound as a part of a static performance, you know, when people are, are interacting with it. Well, I think um, what's particularly interesting for us is, like volume, is um, having a grid, grid of 48 columns of, sa of sound, and, and, uh, and uh, arraying, uh, arranging that sound in such a way produces really kind of unusual, beautiful um, um, feeling, really, isn't it? And, and the same with the pendulum, um, having, having kind of swinging sound, you just don't hear that. We're, we're interested in spatially exploring sound in a new way. But we don't actually make music ourselves. We, we always collaborate with musicians. We just give them really hard um, 
ways of <laughs> making it really. Yeah, I mean, I suppose um, we also uh, started our career uh, in UVA as being um, people who created content for musicians. So the musicians on a stage and we're creating an environment for them or almost a backdrop. Um, but as you can see through the progression that we went through, we have been creating pieces that in themselves are an audio visual experience. And uh, we have been making the tools for musicians to experiment with, with us as a collaboration. For example, the reactor tool that we were showing there in, in um, uh, the chorus project uh, was made by us in-house. I mean, uh, and Matt says, you know, we, we don't make the music necessarily, but, but there's a lot of musicians in um, UVA. Uh, but Frustrated we, ones. Yes. <laughs> we, we, we try and um, we, we, we think it's important to collaborate. Um, and music um, is something that, um, you know, some people, it's their passion and they're very, very good at it. And uh, we, we, we like to think or we hope that we, what we're doing in our art is something very powerful. And it's difficult to be masters of two, two different things. So for that reason, we try and collaborate but, uh, by, by giving uh, opportunities for other musicians to, to put some input. And a follow-up would be, in a case like your work, uh, Volume, how much was sound a part of the project from the beginning in terms of informing the visual scheme as opposed to uh, reactive to the visual scheme? Uh, well, that's, that's a very interesting question. I mean, the system really was, um, there was a feedback loop happening. If you're talking in, in technical terms, how, how it worked, or, or are you saying did, what came first, the music? Or well, I'm the... interested in both, but, but primarily creatively as you approach the work. Um, it, it happened in a organic process. Um, we, as, as Matt touched on earlier, um, how do you make a 46 or 48.6 surround sound music um, score? Um, well, I don't know anyone else who's attempted it. Um, I'm sure Brian Eno's probably had a stab, but um, I think, I think um, Massive Attack found it difficult, yeah. really, and we had to build some tools. I mean, we had much bigger ambitions initially. I mm. mean, we wanted there to be, I mean, it was just almost like 48 samples in a, in a grid, but we wanted to make more of a kind of synthesizer out of it, so your relationship between two columns would modulate, but that was just opening a massive can of worms, which... We would have gone down, but it just the processing power wasn't wasn't there for, 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 from a technical point of view. Yeah, and I think also, um, like with many things, you know, your objectives. You know, if you set your standards very high, and your objectives, you know, quite a long way up there, and you 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 keep your eye on them, you you might not get there, and um, you might run out of time, might run out of money or resources, or it may you may have set your your sights too high. Um, but um, you know you have to maybe just sometimes settle for something that's achievable, mm -hmm. but um, uh, and hope that you you've got some way towards where you wanted to get. And certainly in volume, that that was one of those things. It did improve as time go, go, has gone on because it's now been in, uh, installed in four separate locations, and each time the process involved has actually been tweaked slightly. Mm -hmm. Um, and we, we but you could spend a lifetime just working with that yeah. 48 grid, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> just exploring the possibilities. So, so I guess the answer to your question is it ended up being what it was um, through a collaborative design process, which is really what we're about at UVA, which is that no one person is responsible for any specific thing, although each person is, is, very, you know, ha ha is very good at, at certain aspects. We, we, we collaboratively do that. Somebody must have a question. Yes. Hello again. Hi. Thank you for your presentation. It was excellent. I had a couple questions, and they're with regards to your design process and how you um, engage with clients, how you generate and research your clients, and what compromises you have to make, and how you negotiate those compromises. Um, that's a very good question. Um, well, it's changed a lot actually over the years. Um, when we started out, we had to, we we did a lot more commercial work, you know, um, for events and things like that, and they would involve advertising agencies and PR companies, and and um and you have to work as a team to realise the brand potential and all of that. But we've been um, since volume and, and and a couple of other installations, we've kind of been commissioned to do more of our kind of own artworks, which is is such a luxury because. 
you know, no one tells you what to do and what color it has to be and, 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 and all of that stuff. And it's actually quite hard now to do commercial work again, even if it's like a really fat, you know, car advert or something like that. We, we kind of tend to go, well, that's going to be a situation where we're just, you know, not going to be into it really. So... But, but, but we still have to engage with clients yeah. in terms of um, the curator of the Howard Assembly Rooms in yeah. Opera North. You know, they have a responsibility yeah. to the people who, who, who employ them to, to deliver a certain project within a certain budget. So really their, their um, neck is on the line mm -hmm. just as much as ours is um, because they, they, if you don't deliver, then they, they have yeah. a responsibility to pick an artist and, and I mean, invest in a project. So. All of these projects are... I'll, you know, we have to pitch for. You know, we have to get an idea together. We, we don't just win jobs automatically, and you're often not up against other artists. And and you know, you have to you have to meet certain um, uh, sort of requirements. Requirements, and, and but um, but that generally, once that that process has uh, finished, you've you've won a commission. There is a lot more freedom than the commercial jobs that we used to. Working, I would say, wouldn't you? Yeah, and at the same time, I think um, the uh, you know I think you said how, how do we engage with our clients? Um, well, there's a lot of ways we engage with the clients. Um, perhaps sometimes the best way is to try and not engage with them too much. Um, and the the good clients are the ones that um, don't try and force you or steer you in a certain direction and allow you to get on with your work. And the bad clients are the ones that are always phoning you up saying, where's my this or where's my that or why is this blue and why is that green? Um, so, so, you know, managing them is, is difficult, but it's something you learn to do through experience. And um, some of the key people in our team, um, their, their sole job is to just look after the relationship with the manager. I guess the, our, the, commercial, the relationship. our commercial clients are kind of more in the music industry, you know, band members and, you know, prima donnas of the world. That, yeah. Um, you know, but that we have to, you know, satisfy their, their creative needs. And, you know, uh, we can't just waltz in and design a show just how we want, want to, you know. So um, that you have to tread a careful board mm. on them. But uh, I think we're, we're quite lucky and very fortunate in a way um, because uh, whilst Matt and I and, uh, and Ashen um, had had a considerable experience commercially, you know, out in the field working um, in either the commercial world or in creative world uh, before we started UVA, uh, we were very lucky that the very first job we, we got as a company was with Massive Attack. And of course, they, they have a, a great history musically, but also creatively. They pick the best photographers and designers for their record covers, and, and they work with some of the best um, music directors. So that really did launch us to a position where, where um, since then, we've very, very rarely had to go out and actually look for work. You know, we don't. Um, film. In fact, I can't even remember of a time when any of us have had to get on the phone and say, "Look, we uh, we're looking for some work." So, but there's a credit crunch now, so we'll yeah, see. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> we'll see. We'll see how that happens. So, does that answer your question? Thank you. No problem. Ah, uh, Andre. What? Uh, it's just a short question. I just want to know, how do you choose the name for your, the title for your pieces? Because I see like these very short la names like volume, chorus, there's this kind of pattern or style in, in the names for your pieces. I just how do we come up with the names? Yeah. Uh, well, they're all one word because we can't think of two things. <laughs> no, I mean volume, for example, it's, it's not volume as in sound, it's a volume. It, it started yep. off as field, I think, and then yep. it's just a volume of sound and light. Yeah. I think sometimes it's um, more poignant with, with kind of one word. Well, we, we, but we do spend sometimes days <laughs> around a table going... We, 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 um, we, we started off um, thinking, look, let's just use one word just to simply describe it, because we looked at what other artists were calling their works, and you know, it's like something or other, 24, or this, that, and the other. Untitled. Um, uh, untitled, whatever. Um, we, we were just thinking, look, let's use one word. And you know what, now it's getting really difficult to think of another one word. You know, if we use two mm. words, then we've broken the mold. So but I, th I think, more I think um, you know, it's just a part of what comes with you yep. know, doing your work. You've, you yep. just have to find a word to sum up that piece. And, yep. And, it, and sometimes it's not easy, sometimes mm. it comes straight away. Yeah. But we all get around the table and send each other emails yeah. for about 
a week. I mean, I mean, if we just take some of the examples here, like volume, as Matt says, is really, yes, it's about sound, but it's also about a three-dimensional structure. You know, it's a volume of air, volume of space. Contact was, you're on a floor, you're perfect, you're contacting with this thing. Uh, echo was about a digital echo. Um, uh, chorus was about a chorus of sounds. Um, so and so, things so. moving in harmony. So, so really, that's what we try and do: is we think about what is it that we've actually made here, and then can we sum that up in one word? And is that a word that no other artist has called in their piece of work before? <laughs> that's how we do it. Better make it a good one. There we go. Okay. So, would you call yourself artists or designers or both? Oh. So, well, I look at it this way. Um, I, I'm from a design, as you saw at the beginning, I actually did a joint honours course, which is fine art and design. I, did, I studied sculpture, and I did communication design, graphic design. And in some way, I think our work, not because of me especially, but it embody, embodies both things. And um, I love design because it's problem solving. You know, you're solving problems and you're communicating to people. Um, but I also love fine art because it's almost like creating problems. You know, volume, you're not solving a problem. You know, there's no right or wrong way to do it. So we have been asked that many times, and, and there's lots of discussion and debate about that. But we try not to let ourselves worry too much about that. I mean, we're not fine artists in a sense where we've got a, 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 an agent and a gallery, and we're selling artworks. You know, it's, it's mainly commission, commissions. So I, I would say that we're, we're kind of more weighted to the design side of things, but um, we also you know, take a lot of inspiration from art and artists, so, yeah. Yeah, I mean, sometimes, some days we're designers who make art, and some days we're artists who are designing things. Um, but uh, we, we, we um, like to think that we do create art from time to time through the design process. And um, we, we, as Matt says, we actually, this is what, actually very, one of the best questions you could have asked because we, we still don't quite know. It depends on, yeah. on what we're working on. And I was going to finish this talk quite happy. No. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much.